Hello, my name is Khan from Systems Group at ETH Zurich. Today I will talk about high bandwidth memory or HBM for short on FPGAs. In particular, I will talk about how HBM can be utilized from a data analytics perspective. First, let me briefly talk about the bandwidth bottleneck on FPGA-based acceleration systems. FPGAs are getting very popular for compute acceleration in data centers thanks to many known advantages uh, to our community, such as highly specialized designs, energy efficiency, determinism, etc. And successful use cases of FPGA span machine learning to database management systems to network-focused applications. But since we have started using FPGAs for compute acceleration, it has become evident that for many applications, FPGAs are at a significant disadvantage compared to other processors. More often than not, the main disadvantage is the limited bandwidth when accessing data. The reason why bandwidth has become so important for FPGAs is because throughput-oriented processing. So on FPGAs, we usually design accelerators to be very deep pipelines. Then we replicate those pipelines to increase our data consumption rate. And usually we have enough resources to reach a parallelism where the consumption rate becomes larger than the available bandwidth. So the system bottleneck becomes uh, the bandwidth. So FPGA vendors are of course aware of this issue. And also to close the gap to CPU or GPU main memory bandwidth, they introduced FPGAs with HPM technology in recent years. I want to briefly introduce the HPM on our target FPGA, which is a Xilinx VCU 37P device. The total size of the HPM is 8 GB. To access the HPM from the FPGA fabric, we instantiate an IP that exposes in total 33 XC3 buses, each 256 bit wide. One important functionality that the HPM controller is implementing is a 32 by 32 crossbar. With this, the entire HPM address space is accessible from all 32 axis 3 channels exposed to the FPGA fabric. This gives the abstraction of a uniform memory that is 8 GB. So to understand the performance characteristics of the HPM, we designed a simple micro benchmark. We attach 32 traffic generators to each AXI uh, 3 port. And these traffic generators can be controlled individually. So what I'm showing on the right is the read bandwidth that we are measuring. On the x-axis, we have the number of ports or the number of traffic generators that are active. On the y-axis, we have the bandwidth in gigabytes per second. Now the difference between the colored lines on the plots is the relative address offset that the traffic generators are using. To put it more simply, with the red line, we get an address separation of 256 me uh, megabytes, so each traffic generator accesses its own HPM channel. In that case, we observe that the uh, read bandwidth nicely scales with the number of ports that we are using. On the contrary, with the orange line, we get an address separation of 0 megabytes. So each traffic generator will try to access the same HBM channel. Logically, this creates contention on the crossbar, and we can see that the bandwidth almost does not scale with the number of ports used in this case. So the most important outcome of this micro benchmark is that we cannot simply rely on the uniformity abstraction given by the crossbar to get the full bandwidth advantages of the HPM. Instead, we have to smartly partition and place our data at runtime to create as little contention as possible on the crossbar, if possible. Okay, now that we introduced the HPM uh, on our target FPGA, let me quickly go over the workloads we are focusing on in this work. Our goal is to basically show where HPM can be useful in a data analytics setting. The first workload is selection. This is a simple workload which is trivially parallel. Therefore, most of the time, it will be bandwidth bound on CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs. And since FPGAs used to be at a disadvantage regarding bandwidth, 
they were normally not preferred for this kind of workload unless the selection is highly complex, such as regular expression ma matching, etc. The second workload is a relational join between two tables. Join algorithms are more data intensive than compute intensive, but still they are tricky to, to parallelize. For instance, a hash partitioning or sorting step is usually necessary to make the join uh, highly parallel. Also, the choice of the right join algorithm depends a lot on the sizes and characteristics of the tables. Although there is a lot of uh, related work on how to perform joins on FPGAs, uh, FPGAs in practical settings are usually not preferred for this workload because the advantage is uh, often not justifiable unless the join predicate is again something highly complex. The third workload that we will look at is stochastic gradient descent on linear models. This algorithm is definitely more compute intensive compared to relational workloads such as joins or selection, but they are still much less compute intensive compared to deep neural network inference or training. Therefore, they can be made easily bandwidth bound on the FPGA as shown by previous work. And since FPGAs were disadvantaged regarding bandwidth, the speed ups against high end CPUs remained limited even for this algorithm. Before I begin going in-depth on each of these workloads, let me briefly talk about the system architecture. On the FPGA, we came up with a reusable topology, making the integration of each accelerator easier. We have a so-called HBM shim that fuses two 256-bit AXI3 ports to make one 512-bit AXI3 port. The advantage of this is first, we have, uh, in a way, hard code parallel access to two HBM stacks, reducing potential contention on the crossbar. And secondly, it makes the design easier because we deal with fewer ports, 16 instead of 32. So the way we utilize these two, uh, the, the 16 ports is we allocate two of them for data movement between the CPU and the FPGA. The remaining 14 can be used by so-called compute engines. So inside these compute engines, we will place our accelerators to perform the target workloads. On the software, we have a database management system running, uh, MoneyDB in this case, that controls and monitors the data movers and the compute engines. Let me now start with our first workload, that is selection. Here I'm showing you one compute engine for performing selection. In total, we will instantiate 14 of them on the FPGA. So this compute engine is relatively simple. It has 16 individual pipelines to process data and therefore can consume 512 bits uh, at the clock rate. One thing to note here is that the read and write pipelines are working in a time multiplexed manner, and this is fine since they are sharing one XC3 port anyway. Rather than dividing the port physically between reads and writes, time multiplexing gives more flexibility in terms of bandwidth allocation between reads and writes. For instance, if we have low selectivity and uh, write much less data than we read, most of the bandwidth can be allocated to reads. Now let's take a look at the performance behavior. Here I'm showing you the data consumption rate on the y-axis and the number of CPU threads or FPGA compute engines on the x-axis. First off, we can see that we reach 11 gigabyte per second consumption rate per engine, where 12.8 gigabytes being the theoretical max, so we are pretty close. Secondly, we see a significant speed up even for a non-compute intensive application as this one, thanks to the HPM. And finally, we observe with the orange curve that if we do not partition the data and lay, uh, lay it out smartly across the HPM, the bandwidth advantage is diminished and we actually become much slower than the CPU. In the second plot, I'm showing you again the consumption rate uh, against the selectivity this time. The higher the selectivity, the more data will be produced 
by each compute engine. In case, in case of 100% selectivity, we produce as much data as we consume. Logically, since we have to share bandwidth between reads and writes, as the selectivity increases, the consumption rate drops uh, as we observe here. Moreover, if we um, also include the time for copying data from the HPM to the CPU memory, we see that the consumption rate gets affected significantly for high selectivity rates, but not so much for uh, low selectivity rates. The good news is, even in the worst case, there is a performance advantage over the CPU numbers with very uh, high thread counts. So for selection uh, intensive processing workloads, an FPGA implementation might make sense here. Okay, now let's have a look at the second workload, the relational join. We implement a hash join in the compute engine. I won't go over the details, but I would like to highlight the main characteristics and the data movement. The hash join consists of two steps. First step is to build a hash table from the smaller side of the join. The second step uh, is to probe the hash table with the larger side of the join. Our implementation here is focused on the second step, so the probing, because uh, here is the largest amount of data processed. So we first build a hash table, and this step is not parallelized. As I mentioned, this step is not performance critical in most cases, and also very difficult to perform in parallel because of collision handling. So we perform this step one value at a time. The probe step is, however, highly optimized and performed with a high parallelism so that we consume 512 bits per clock cycle. Now, to illustrate how we move the data and perform the join, let's first have a look at the overview of the system. We instantiate seven of these join engines, uh, and let's assume that we need to perform a join between a large and a small table. Here, I'm showing you how we place these tables on the FPGA. So the large table is in the HPM, and the small table is placed in on-chip memory resources of the FPGA, so BRAM and UltraRAM. The small table is actually replicated across all the join engines. So during the probe step, each join engine reads a portion of the large table from the HPM and produces the join result back to the HPM. This way of parallelizing the hash join uh, operation is the same as MoneyDB query engine does it. So that is uh, one of the reasons why we choose this method to make the integration easier. Another reason is it fits how the HPM can be highly utilized thanks to the partitioned way of processing the larger table. Now let's have a look at the performance. On the y-axis, we have the data consumption rate, and on the x-axis, we have the number of threads or compute engines for the FPGA. Let me briefly explain the different configurations. L load means that we include the time for reading the entire L from CPU memory. S unique means whether we have to perform collision handling during probing. If S is not unique, we indeed have to check for collisions at the hash table during probing, uh, which reduces our processing rate. So the worst case for the FPGA across these configurations is if we have to load L and S is not unique. Even in that case, which is the dashed green line, we see that the performance is uh, the same as 64 threads on the CPU. In the best case, the FPGA is 13 times faster than 64 threads on the CPU. But until now, we assume that the smaller table actually fits URAM. So what if it does not? In this plot, I'm showing you the join runtime, again for different configurations, against a growing size of the smaller table. So we see that once uh, S does not fit URAM, we have to process it in parts. So we copy one part of the S, build the hash table, probe the L, then move on to the next part of the S, probe the same L again, and so forth. 
This, of course, increases the run times linearly. We observe that for some uh, configurations, especially if S is unique, the FPGA maintains the performance advantage over the CPU until uh, 125,000 items in S. So in conclusion, uh, for the common case of large versus small table join, we can say that the HBM and the FPGA are highly beneficial and can be considered as an alternative for the CPU. However, it cannot be used as a high-performance generic join implementation for all cases. Finally, let's have a look at stochastic gradient descent. The SGD is mainly about iteratively reading the same data and processing it with a high rate. So our implementation focuses on deep pipelining uh, to make sure different steps of this algorithm can be performed in parallel. To illustrate the main parts, uh, such as the dot product uh, and the model update, can be performed in parallel once the pipeline is full. However, for small dimensional datasets, uh, the pipeline might not be entirely filled because of read after write dependencies. So the performance will be lower for small dimensional datasets. Regarding data movement, uh, since SGD uses data iteratively, that means we copy it once and use it multiple times. So the initial copy time from the CPU to the FPGA becomes negligible. Secondly, the data set is replicated on the HPM so that each SGD engine can access the data nicely in a partitioned way to get the bandwidth benefits. Also, in case the entire data set does not fit the HPM, it's not too bad because SGD can be performed in a blockwise manner. So one block of data is brought to the HPM, the model is trained on that block for some iterations, then we bring the next block and so on. Let's have a look at the performance. So I'm showing you on the uh, I'm showing you the data consumption rate on the y-axis. Uh, one plot, the plot on the left, is showing the rate against uh, the number of threads. The other plot, the plot on the right, is showing uh, it again uh, against uh, different data sets. As we see, we get a significant performance advantage around 3x over 28 threaded high end CPU implementation. Another observation uh, uh, on the second plot is that for small dimensional data sets, the advantage is less pronounced because the pipeline cannot be entirely filled, as I mentioned earlier. So finally, let me conclude uh, my talk with some takeaway messages. First of all, uh, for all workloads that use the HPM, it is highly important that the data is partitioned and placed across uh, the address space so that it can be accessed without creating contention over the crossbar. Uh, for the selection workload, we have seen that FPGA becomes an interesting target processor for even trivially parallel and bandwidth-bound applications. For the join workload, we have seen that algorithms with complicated data consumption and production patterns might not benefit from HPM that easily. The benefit here might only come in carefully designed systems and some corner cases. And finally, uh, for the SGD workload, we have seen that moderately compute intensive algorithms that access data regularly and iteratively are a good match for the HPM. Therefore, the FPGA's advantage over high-end CPUs for workhorse ML algorithms such as SGD is, is even more pronounced with HPM. And that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.